I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. So several years ago, I did the first of a couple of podcasts I did with Gary Kasparov, probably the best chess player in history. He was the world champion. He was the world chess champion for 20 years. And subsequently after that, Gary and I have become friends. We've hung out a little bit and I've, I've got to know him a lot better. He's a very, very good guy, cares about, uh, you know, and, and helps run organizations devoted to human rights and humanitarian issues and very, very good, complex person, not just defined by his chest, but also by his global activism around the world. And I'm pleased that I've gotten to know him. So I want to tell some stories and then actually going to re-release the episode I did several years ago because it was it's an evergreen sort of timeless episode about chess. Chess has gotten very popular lately because of the TV show, The Queen's Gambit. And I just want to tell a little of my story of chess for a second, which is that I kind of started playing late for someone who eventually becomes, you know, like I'm a, I'm currently ranked a chess master, which sounds very strong and impressive. And I guess is, but you always compare yourself to, I, I always tend to compare myself with people better. So there's a lot of players who are grandmasters or international masters. And, and of course, then there's people like Gary Kasparov, who's just world champ, you know, best player in history level. And, but it was a very fun moment, uh, having him on the podcast. I'll describe that in a second, but uh, I started playing when I was about 17. And again, someone like Gary, I don't know. He probably started playing when he was like six years old or five years old. Bobby Fischer started playing when he was a little kid. All the great chess players started playing when they were really tiny. I was, I was like an old man to start at the age of 17. But by the time I was 18, I had won the New Jersey junior chess championship. And it, it's always a question like, oh, you know, you must be smart or you must be talented. Chess has nothing to do with intelligence and it has nothing to do. I mean, maybe it has a little to do with talent, but I know I, I, I've known incredibly talented chess players who never hit the potential they could because they just did not work at it. Like with anything, chess or anything is maybe two to 5% talent. And the rest is hard work, blood, sweat, and tears. And when you do something that you love and you're passionate about, it's not fun, really. I mean, it's it's fun enough that you're willing to spend the time working at it, but it's a very painful process. I remember sometimes I'd, I'd be 18 years old and sometimes I'd play in a tournament and I would lose even one game and I was so upset at myself, I would just drop out of the tournament. I just wouldn't show up for the next game and they would have to default me. And I did this, I did this even in the national junior championship where I lost two games in a row and I was so disgusted with myself, I just left. And I was representing New Jersey, like in, it's called the Tournament of High School Champions or something in uh, 1986. 
I was I was a bad loser. Now I'm 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 much better at it. And I, and you learn. That's one of the things you learn playing something competitive like chess or poker or a sport or whatever is that you learn how to lose because you cannot get better if you can't understand the psychology of losing and why sometimes you lose as you're learning. Every time I learn something new in chess, and this applies to anything, like if you learn something new in tennis or learn something new in a language for a while, like I'll give, I'll give another example. So I was taking ping pong lessons and even though I've been playing ping pong all of my life, I, my instructor, who's also been on the podcast, Wally Green, my instructor basically told me, Hey, everything you're doing is wrong. Every habit you have is a bad habit. And I'm like, I've been playing this way all my life and it hasn't been bad for me. And he said, yeah, but you could have been a lot better if you had good habits instead of bad habits. So he showed me all the good habits and we practiced them for months. And then the very next time I played ping pong after all these lessons, I thought I was going to be great. I was horrible because whenever you learn something new, it's not only about the learning, but then it, you, so your learning might be at a certain level. Your learning might've gone from zero to 10, but now you're applying it in practice has to go from zero to 10. So you have to stop playing in all of your bad habits that you're used to and start playing in the new habits that takes a while. And so you, at first you're losing, even though you're trying to do all the good habits. And even though you've learned them, it's very frustrating because the first thing that happens is you start losing more, whether it's ping pong or poker or chess or speaking a language, or I don't know, learning math or science, playing tennis or playing golf. If you learn a new swing in golf, I bet you at first you get very disappointed because you're not playing as well because you're used, your body is used to the bad habits. It's confused now with all of these new habits. So once I figured that out, it's important when you're losing to understand, am I losing because uh, I'm adapting to this new knowledge I have, or am I losing because I'm actually just playing bad? I'm maybe I'm rusty. Am I losing because I'm not, I'm taking it for granted somehow, like, because I had all these lessons, I assumed I would be great. And, and I'm not, there, there's all sorts of subtleties in the psychology of losing. And, and this applies to business failure as well. And, and it certainly applies to investing failure. Like if you switch investing styles, you go from growth to value investing, nobody is a successful investor all the time. So you have to understand the reasons why you might be losing money. Did you not do enough research that a value investor is supposed to do? It's different than what a growth investor does. Or, or was it just a, 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 an economic event that caused you to lose? Is it something else? Did you not hold long enough? Or did you not understand the story enough or whatever? So anyway, that's, I didn't mean to go into a whole psychology of losing, but it's just a near and dear subject to my heart because anyone who tries to be good at something that's worth being good at is going to lose an enormous amount of times, an enormous, enormous amount of times, much like for instance, comedy, I do stand up comedy. Well, all my life I've been funny with my friends, but when you go on stage and then you start learning some skills on stage, guess what? You're going to bomb quite a bit until you get used to it, until you learn how to be yourself again, but with the habits of a stand up comedian. Anyway, all this is to stay. I learned chess at 17. I started playing in tournaments uh, when I was 17. I was a senior in high school when I won the New Jersey's junior championship. And then I stopped playing for a long time. I just, I went to college. There were girls. I got interested in that. I got interested in computers. And then I got interested again. I started studying again. I want to say about 10 years later, by the way, the way I got good in that, in that one year, I got good really fast is I did almost the same techniques that I do now when I'm learning something, which is I got myself a coach. I read a lot of books. I practiced by playing in tournaments whenever I could. So I got the combination of book knowledge, a coach to give me feedback and I played and then analyzed my games. Always very important to analyze your losses. Even more important than analyzing your wins is to analyze your losses. And having a coach is very important as well, no matter what you're doing, whether it's a life coach for life in general, or a golf coach or a chess coach. It's if you remember my podcast episode with Anders Ericsson, the developer of the famous 10,000 hour rule, he talks about deliberate practice and part of deliberate practice is repetition and then 
analyze each occurrence of the repetition. So analyze your games, analyze your losses, uh, analyze why you didn't remember a list of numbers or whatever it was he was trying to teach. Having a coach and having the coach help you with feedback is very important. And so I did that. I had uh, a couple of coaches, including for a while, uh, this guy, Sammy Ryshevsky. And if you don't know who he is, he was a very great player. He was probably the best player in the world in the 1940s. He's, he's passed away now, but in the night, and when he was a little kid, he was a prodigy. There's a famous picture of him from like 1905, uh, playing, uh, he's a little boy and he's playing like a room full of older men, uh, simultaneously, uh, at the same time, but he was, he was probably the best player in the world, but the Russians in the forties had a tendency to cheat in tournaments and he was never able to win the world championship. And then Bobby Fischer kind of eclipsed him in the early 1960s and became the best American player. But by then Ryshevsky was already, already older, but I took lessons from Ryshevsky, which was an amazing experience to, to learn from such a, a great and historic player like that. And then in, in 1997, I started taking lessons from uh, John Fedorowicz, a, a great grandmaster based in, in New York City. And I was taking lessons up to three times a week. And that's when, even though I was already a strong player, that's when I became super strong and was probably my peak level was 1997. Uh, uh, I, and that was the last time I played in a tournament, basically, because I realized once I wasn't uh, studying it as seriously, I was only going to get worse, particularly at that level where you had to kind of study constantly to stay in shape. But what I wanted to talk about with this before the Gary episode starts is what chess did for me after that, which is, it's not so much, Oh, I, the skills I learned at chess, I applied in life. It was really the fact that just getting good at something like that, something that's sort of intellectually respected, really helped me in a lot of ways that were unexpected. Like I didn't have the best grades in high school, but because I was the New Jersey's junior chess champion, I got into the only college I ever applied to. And then I got into graduate school because uh, uh, the graduate school I applied to was building Deep Blue, the the chess computer, which Gary Kasparov and I talk about in this podcast. And, and Gary talks about his experiences with deep blue. So I was the only chess master in at the grad school. So they, they let me in because they needed somebody to test out their computer every now and then. And the, the guy who made the computer became my office mate. No surprise. Then it helped me get a job. Uh, I remember applying for a job at HBO. I was totally unqualified. And afterwards I went outside to play chess. I ran into another, uh, a, very, a very strong chess master. And he was playing chess in the park, Elon Schwartz, who was one of my very first podcast episodes back in 2014, because now he's a poker champion. If you're good at one game, you'll be good at many. It's kind of like they all, it's like learning Italian after you learn Spanish. They kind of have the same rule. Every game, every difficult game has sort of the same rules of grammar in terms of learning it. Uh, I use learns of rules of grammar metaphorically. But I, I, this is in 1994. I, I ran into Elon Schwartz and in, in playing chess in Bryant Park. We played and I won. And I saw the guy who had interviewed me at HBO was watching the game. Turned out he was a chess player. I didn't know that. And we spent some time talking about chess and the job. And then he offered me the job on the spot, even though I had a feeling I was not going to get the job. And on and on and on. This has helped me so many times in life. There's also been a, a dark side of it for me. And a little bit, I'm kind of, going through that right now, to be honest, which is there have been times where I get a little, I don't, I don't want to say burnt out. I love everything I'm doing. I love writing. I love, um, podcasting. I love business and investing, but every now and then I'll get a little bit tired and I almost want like a, a mental break. And so I'll get, a, this happened to me in 1992 where I got, I, I was, I had, sort of a job I was a little unhappy with and some other things in my life going on that I was a little unhappy with. I wanted to be a writer, but I was going through the learning phase of writing. And so I was writing just bad stuff all the time. And I was getting a little frustrated with that. And so I started playing chess online. This is in 1992 before kind of the web was, was really out there. Uh, I played on a, a chess server that I actually helped create the internet chess club. And 
there were thousands of chess players on it every day from all over the world. You could go on and you could play, and it still exists, by the way. You could go on and play people from Israel, from Spain, from Russia, from wherever, 24 hours a day. And I would literally play maybe 22 hours a day, go home, sleep for two hours, and then come back. And it was just not a healthy way to live. Like one story was, I was uh, 6 p.m., uh, my girlfriend at the time calls me and says, don't forget at 6 30, we have people coming over for dinner. And I said, okay, don't worry. I'll be there. Uh, it's only, I'm only going to play one more game on the chess server. And, uh, at midnight I was still playing. It wasn't like playing serious games. I was playing one minute games where you have one minute to make all your moves. And then the game is over. And she was so upset. She like came to my office at like midnight and was banging on the door, but I wouldn't open it. It was locked. And I was too obsessed with playing to, to, to open the door. And, you know, that was basically, you know, a bad thing. And then, um, you know, it's happened to me once or twice since then, something like that, like that addictive kind of behavior. And, you know, because it's so easily accessible online, I would, I would just get obsessed, uh, if there was any, if I was just even slightly burnt out or frustrated or whatever. And, uh, I would say recently, you know, this, this TV show, the Queen's Gambit is on Netflix. If you haven't watched it, you should watch it. It's an excellent show. Um, it's based on a, a book by Walter Tevis who wrote the hustler and wrote the color of money. And I loved the book when I was 18. I loved the show. And I was like, Oh, I, you know, I should get back to my old strength and chess. I figured I'm going to relearn, you know, not that I forgot everything. I'm still a strong player, but I'm not as strong as I was at my peak. I'm nowhere near uh, uh, as uh, like my, the old me could probably be the current me two out of three times. I'm probably what's called one standard deviation away from my peak in statistical terms. And so I figured, you know what? I'll just get back to my old strength. And so I started playing again online. And, and I think I've just been doing a lot of things lately. Like I, I finished two books in the past few months. I, I, I you know, have been starting a business uh, relating to writing a new piece of podcasting software or creating a new piece of podcasting software. I'm involved in a lot of different investments. Of course, I love doing this podcast. And, but you know what? Sometimes you're just doing, I think I bit off, and I, and I still, still doing stand up comedy, particularly now that parts of the country are open. And, you know, of course, I remain safe with it, but I'm still doing it. And, uh, cause I love it. And, there's nothing I've really wanted to give up, but I think I bit off more than I can chew, particularly writing all these books and starting companies. I tried to start another company as well. Uh, and it's almost like the lockdown cleared my schedule and I immediately filled it up with many more difficult things. And so, yes, I do my daily practice. I always try which I, I talk about this daily practice and choose yourself. It's the method by which I've always bounced back from going broke or other times when I've been depressed, it's physical health, emotional health, creative health, spiritual health. So I try to stick to my daily practice. It's a daily practice after all, but still I've been an extra amount of burnt out and uh, I started playing chess again, almost obsessively and, you know, much to the chagrin of almost everyone around me. And it's addictive to do that because I keep saying to myself, I should be getting back, you know, and, and, and alongside that, I'm also, you know, getting back to my learning techniques. So I have this one, I have some theories that I didn't have 20 years ago or 30 years ago about chess and chess learning that I've been trying out and they've been working, uh, which I could describe at another point what I'm doing, but it basically involves very quickly doing fast repetition of what's called, uh, problems like chess, studying chess tactics. So you could see very quickly, many moves ahead and doing it over and over and over again, faster and faster each time. So I'll go through like a thousand problems. Um, and let's say it'll take a couple of weeks and then I'll try to cut the time in half, go through a thousand problems in half the time, and then a thousand problems in half the time. And it's building up really good intuition, but it's one of those things, like I was mentioning earlier, I'm learning these new things 
and new ways of seeing uh, the chessboard and the chess positions. And I'm studying some new what's called openings. And, you know, so I have, I, as I've been absorbing this new knowledge, sometimes I play great. Sometimes I play only okay. And sometimes it gets a little frustrating. So that combined with the burnout of biting off more than I can chew, uh, you know, plus there's an additional thing, actually, I, I for, totally forgot, which has had a big effect on me, which is I wrote this New York City is, is dead article and I'm literally beating a dead horse by talking about this again. But I realized that some of the reaction to it from people I knew in particular you know, really sort of affected me. And I, I don't want to get into this too much, but anybody who thinks they don't, anyone who says to you, oh, I never care what people think, they are probably lying because it's impossible. We're human. Maybe I don't care what everybody thinks, but I do certainly care what some people think. And I think, I think the, it, I've never written an article where four months later, I still get hate mail for it even hate mail from people I know and, and like, like I've lost friends over this good friends, or I suspect I've lost friends because there's some people who just that were good friends that have just dropped out. And, uh, I think that bothered me too. And added to the burnout in addition to, you know, not just having one job, like being a podcaster, but trying to start two companies, writing two books, writing articles every day, uh, dealing with my investing and, and, but then dealing with the nonstop kind of just has, I've never had an article that I, I've had articles go viral, but not like this. And then I've had articles where people have been angry at me, but not like this. And then I've had articles where I've lost friends, but not like this. And that I think led to some burnout. And so sometimes it's not like I'm depressed. It's just like burnout or maybe it is a little bit of depression. And I'm again, keeping to my daily practice to stay, you know, get done with the things I need to get done and, and to stay as above board as possible. But I've also noticed that I'm just obsessively playing again. And so I'm, I'm part of me talking about it is so I could stop. It sounds like a stupid thing. It's not like I'm a crack addict or anything. You know, it's not, it's not like Hunter Biden and I are hanging out in China with crack whores and just casual. I don't even know why he's still smoking crack. Like I thought that was only an eighties drug, but in any case, it is kind of like that because it becomes this obsessive thing, which if I describe to you how obsessed you'll see what I mean. And it reminds me of also my dad, who was a strong chess player, very strong chess player in the sixties. Uh, he had a hard time when he was exactly my age, he went broke and he lost his business and he got really depressed and he didn't have a daily practice and he just stayed depressed for the rest of his life. And he was exactly my age, he was 52. And he would just, he did nothing after that. From 52 till he died around the age of 70, he just did nothing ever again, really. He tried, but it didn't, nothing ever really worked out for him. And I always was thinking to myself, boy, I wonder if I'm gonna end up like him you know, both the good and the bad. He was a very good person. He was a very decent person. He was a very honest person and taught me a lot about honesty. And, uh, he, he, uh, he just, he was just a little too optimistic. He was never able to bounce back because in order to really analyze situations in a healthy way, you have to look at the good and the bad. You have to analyze what can go wrong. You have to, you know, answer the objections as they say. And he was not able to do that. I even noticed this when I, when I was learning chess at the age of 17, I've, I would of course play with him. He was my first instructor. And I always noticed even then when I started beating him that he was just way too optimistic. He would, he would always think he was winning right up until the point where it was very obvious that I was winning. And he was so ferocious. Like he would attack and attack and attack me on the chessboard, and he would just throw everything at me. And so I got really good at defending because of that, because he was just a nonstop aggressive attacker, but he wouldn't always know when the attack is over. Sometimes you have to know when to step back and, and say to yourself, the situation has changed. And that happened in his business. Also, he was in, um, he wrote software for mainframes, accounting software for mainframe computers. If you don't know what a mainframe computer is, 
no worries. It's the kind of computer that existed before the microcomputers we all use now. And uh, I told, I remember telling him when I was like, you know, 18 or 17 that, hey, these things like the Apple II Plus uh, or the Macintosh, they're starting to be very popular and they're getting more and more powerful. And he's like, computers will never, I mean, corporations will never use anything but mainframe computers. And again, his optimism basically killed his business. He didn't realize that the situation had changed. And you kind of, when you're in business, you kind of have to ask yourself every single day, has the situation changed? And in the chessboard, you have to do the same thing. On the poker table, you have to do the same thing. Oh, he made a bet, she made a bet that I didn't expect in a, in a situation that's very critical for me. The situation has changed and I need to rethink this. Or, hmm, I thought I was ahead on the chessboard. I thought I had a good attack, but it seems like it's I'm having a few more problems. The situation has changed. You always have to ask, has the situation changed? Oh, I was growing users on my website by 10% a day. Now, just yesterday, I lost users for the first time. Has the situation changed? Uh, and same thing with investing in stocks. Apple just went down 20%. I'm making this up, but it's something, or people viewing the cell phone industry differently. You always have to look around every day and ask, has the situation changed? changed and he wasn't able to do that. And I could see that early on, but it was really after his business collapsed that he kind of got depressed, lost confidence in himself. And I remember after he died, I was cleaning up his desk and um, he still had the, the chess game open and he was using the same chess server uh, that I had helped build in 1990, you know, one, 1992. And this was now, I guess, 2006. And so it was 15 years later. And I saw he had played in the past two or three prior years, he had played over 40,000 games on this chess server. That's how addicted he had been. And there were other things. And so when I first went broke on my first, because of my first business, I had made some money just like him. And then I went broke just like him. I'd gotten divorced just like him. And I was always afraid, boy, am I going to end up just like him? Like he had a stroke, was sort of incapacitated and immobilized in bed for two years. I kind of think he was awake, but not able to communicate, not able to move at all. And I was really afraid everything was running in parallel to him. And here I am 52, just like he was when he started playing addictively in chess and, and never was able to really bounce back again, never was able to really recover. And I've always, I've gone on and done things further than him. I was able to start a second business, third business, fourth business. I've had success in ways that he didn't have in both emotionally in my relationships and in business and with my friendships. He was a little bit Asperger-ish. He didn't really get people's cues that much, uh, social cues. So I was very different from him and I knew that, but still there was always this worry. And again, now here I am at 52, a little burnt out and doing what he did, which is, you know, sometimes waking up a little early, sometimes staying up a little late, sometimes missing meetings, but obsessively playing this game. It's a beautiful game that has done so much for me in so many ways. Like it's, it's really defined my whole career. In some ways, you know, it got me interested in all games. I became good at games like poker, backgammon, Scrabble, uh, 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 I don't know, checkers, all sorts of card games, uh, um, Othello. I got, I got obsessed with games in general. And, and I was also unlike him. I, I decided to become good at every game and study what the shortcuts are in every game. But chess, always my first love for games. And now with the show, The Queen's Gambit, I got inspired to study a little, but then that studying turned into this obsession combined, you know, that was added to by the burnout of taking on so many activities. Plus, uh, uh, and I don't even think that would have caused me to burn out if it wasn't for just four months of nonstop hate mail. Although to be fair, it's died down this week. I haven't seen that much this week, uh, it's four months later, but that said, uh, 
I'm, I'm playing, I'm learning, I'm getting better. Uh, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll calm down. I think I'll be, I will. And, uh, and I'm not as burned out as I was even a few weeks ago. And, you know, things are going well. And, um, but, uh, because the show's popular and a lot of people have asked me about it, decided to re-release this episode with Gary Kasparov at the time when you're listening to this, this podcast that you're about to listen to, it's totally evergreen. doesn't matter that it was a few years ago. Cause we're talking about events that happened years earlier anyway. And we're talking about his experience after the podcast was over. I asked him if he could play a game of chess with me because here, it might be the only time I'm ever sitting in front of the best chess player in history. I had to ask. And he, I could tell he did not want to play, but he was very gracious. He played me. He crushed me. I played, I played an opening that I played maybe a thousand times in tournaments. It was the, for those who are into chess, it was like Kings Indian, Knight G2 variation. He made a move early on that I'd never seen before after playing this thousands of times and studying it. And I thought, oh, okay, he's making a mistake maybe, but of course, Obviously, it wasn't a mistake, and he crushed me. And you couldn't even tell. People watching the game couldn't even tell that he had crushed me pretty early on because it was just like my position was frozen while he slowly dominated after that. But it was still an honor to, to play him. And like I said, after that, we became friends and, and uh, would see each other occasionally and, and talk about lots of things. And um, it was always a, a very fascinating guy. But pleased to uh, reintroduce this podcast, the Gary Kasparov episode about uh, chess and AI and uh, lose it, being the first world champion to lose to a computer, a computer that I had happened to work on just by coincidence. And uh, this was a, this was a, an honor for me. The next time I had him on, by the way, I have a fun picture, which I, I think I put it on my Instagram. Uh, it had Gary, cause I, I called a couple of my friends to come over because I knew some people who were interested in chess. So I had a picture of me, um, Gary Kasparov, of course, uh, Jim Norton, the stand-up comedian uh, who I grew up with and we were in the high school chess club together. The Jizza from the Wu-Tang Clan, whose websites I had built in the 90s and I knew he was interested in chess. And Maria Konnikova, who has uh, been on the podcast quite a bit and was still writing her book on poker. And it's a, a fun photo to have, but that was on the second time he came on the podcast. Anyway, here's Gary Kasparov on Chess, AI, and the World. I want to do a brief intro here. This is, um, you know, I've done several hundred podcasts with all sorts of people, but if people ask me over the past several years, who is the number one or two person you would absolutely love to have on the podcast is Gary Kasparov, former world, you were, you were like number one in the world in chess for, for 20 some 20 years, years yes. and world champion for, for most of that. Uh, I've been following your career since, I don't know, 1982. Read your what is same generation? Read, read fighting chess. Uh, I'm 2200 rated, so I always was wow. keeping track. Of, not <laughs> not you. I, I'm well, a gnat. Uh, I'm an look, ant on the floor compared to you. But world chess champion for so many years, and you were for uh, a while the, the coach of the current world chess champion Magnus Carlsen. Now, you wrote this your latest book, Deep Thinking. For the first time, you wrote about this famous, or I would say infamous match from 20 years ago. Two matches, 96, two matches, 97. Two matches. Deep Blue versus you was the first time uh, a computer, and this one was owned by IBM, first time a computer beat the world chess champion in a match. And ever since the computer was invented, it was kind of considered iconic that if a computer could beat holy chess... Grail. Holy yeah, Grail. Yeah, it was the Holy Grail. If a computer could beat the world champion in chess, then there's AI. And you were there. You were you were the world champion at the time. I was the Holy Grail. <laughs> you, were, you were the Holy Grail. And I want to say, I was in the audience for that match in 1997. And in 1989, I was you office also watched, mates. You also watched the match in 1989 when I played with this team? I was, I was office mates with Feng Shu. Ah, so I, was, ah. I, I played on Chip Test before it was renamed Deep Thought. Yeah. And I would play against openings, you know, and, and wow. on, on ah. Chip Test. So, so I know all about from beginning to... I, IBM offered me a job to work on Deep Blue. And, wow. Uh, <laughs> and I, you know why I turned it? I turned it down because of a girl. I stayed in Pittsburgh. Big mistake. I should have worked on Deep Blue <laughs> and been part of the team that, that won. But 
this book was so interesting. Why'd you write it now, 20 years later? Oh, I mean, let's not mislead, you know, our listeners, you know. It's not just about Kaspar versus Deep Blue, you know. Um, it's about, you know, history of what I believe the most important relations of the 21st century, humans and machines. And um, chess, you, know, you, you were right, saying that from the very beginning of computer science, chess was seen by, you know, giants uh, uh, and legends as uh, uh, like Alan Turing and, and Claude Shannon as the, you know, as the ultimate test. Yeah. If machine solves this test, means beating the world champion, that's a proof of artificial intelligence. Okay, who am I to criticize them, but they were wrong. Machine won this match, but it's, it was as intelligent as your alarm clock. Well, well, that's just ten, it. ten million dollar alarm clock, but still, you know. It, but that's just it. Everything, everything is sort of AI until it's done, and then they realize, no, oh, that's the, not real yeah, intelligence. It, 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 we, you know, we can spend a lot of time, you know, discussing the semantics. You know, what is artificial intelligence? You know, D- does it mean that we have to, you know, replicate the process in human brains, or we should look simply at the result? And if machine reaches this result, you know, is it artificial intelligence by definition, or you know, it's still, you know. Um, there's still a big gap between the way the humans making decisions, you know, the rich conclusions, and machines, you know, okay, achieving somehow similar results. Well, well, I wanna I wanna reel back just one second about your career itself. So obviously you weren't born world champion. It it took work. And I'm very interested in just uh, peak performance and what got you to this point where you were the holy grail. So so you were born obviously talented and your talent was recognized and early you, you, you very early on um but what then separated you out from let's say your your peers who may have been just as talented like what do you like just what would you say slow down I mean, is you know, as talented is probably it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stretch <laughs> no i get i was i was lucky you know i was born in a family uh, uh where you know chess uh, was kind of part of culture so uh-huh. my father and my mother they they usually spend their, their their winter nights, you know, looking at the newspaper uh, chess sections, you know, solving problems. So a uh, few other relatives, you know, they play chess again at amateurs level, but chess was there as in many, in, you know, um, intelligent families uh, in the Soviet Union. Mm. Uh, and also I was born in the Soviet Union. So when the talent was discovered, you know, I had an opportunity sort of to learn, you know, uh, to be taught by, you know, semi-professionals, then professionals. So the the, the, the framework for, for my talent to be discovered and 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 uh, uh, to be polished, you know, was there. Uh, so that's that's you may call luck, uh, but um, the talent was quite unique, you know. So it, uh, since you know I uh, since I discovered chess, you know, I moved very quickly, you know, just you know beating you know not only you know kids of my age but you know older age. And by age twelve, I was already the Soviet junior champion under eighteen. Hmm. So. Um, you know, it was very natural for for all people who helped me, starting, of course, with my mother. My father died when I was seven, but my mother spent her entire life, you know, helping helping me and and, and making sure that, you know, my talent uh, uh, will... Uh, uh, will um, help me to 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 reach the uh, to reach the the very top of the world of chess. So, and so not only in chess, of course. So so, so would you say so? So then, um, I guess she or the environment introduced you to Mikhail Botvinnik, who was a former world champion. Yeah, it, you yeah went it's, to his it's, a, it's a part. It's a part of the of the uh, Soviet chess system. So um, uh, people believe, and it's they're, they're wrong in believing that chess was a part of the education of the Soviet Union. Actually, it was never part of education. Uh, that's what I, I've been trying to accomplish. You know, after I became the world champion, I've been doing it now around the world. But in the Soviet Union, chess was viewed as a very important ideological tool to demonstrate, uh, um, to display the intellectual superiority of communist system over decadent West. So that's why you know um, there was a very sophisticated network uh, of searching for young talents. And when the talent is found, to make sure that this talent will not be wasted and will be given proper attention to, you know, just to go as high as possible. So at age 10, um, when I played for um, the team of my nat- uh, native republic of Azerbaijan uh, at the first uh, um, all-Soviet uh, youth games, and I was 10 and I played at, uh, at, um, with, with boys that were uh, 14 and 15 years old, and I did fairly well and uh, I was noticed and uh, invited to Botvinnik School, 
And then again, my progress was fast. And uh, at every level, I received certain attention that was required. That's why, you know, I could I could make this, you know, this fast progress without wasting time, you know, for, you know, searching, uh, uh, while searching for uh, uh, specific assistance. So, so, but there was not just a talent at chess. There was also a talent at, I mean, you were also known as like one of the most prepared uh, yeah, but that's, world that's, champions that's, that's ever. More, that's more about the style, you know? Mm-hmm. It's just, I had an appetite for for analyzing, you know, chess games and looking deeply in the in opening positions. And of course, working with, uh, with my great mentor, Mikhail Batvinik, the, the former world chess champion who, who was a scientist, you know? Some chess players, they're artists. Some of them are scientists. Some of them are just, you know, just playing for sport. So some of them are, you know, combination of all these factors, but but Vinik was predominantly a scientist, and it uh, it helped me to actually to uh, sharpen my analytical skills, and uh, I I had appetite even now, you know, just age fifty four, I'm you know I'm I've retired for more than ten years, I still have an interest, you know, just analyzing the games, looking at you know other games played by top players, and you know just always looking for you know some revelations. So uh, I just want to ask: Is it true, uh, Badvinik once trained by having playing a match with someone smoking into his face? Uh, you know, it's the story. Yes, it's the Badvinik. Badvinik played at a time, you know, just in in thirties, forties, and fifties, and early sixties. You know, when you know the, the smoking was loud, you know, and this is the audience uh, could 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 get very you know excited. Could be a lot of noise. And again, this is part of Batvinik's, you know, uh, Batvinik's preparation. He wanted to be prepared for every surprise, not only at the chessboard, but also around the chessboard. And one of the problems was that, you know, the, his opponent could, could, smoke, could smoke. And uh, he wanted his, his uh, assistant who worked with him and played his training games, another grandmaster, not just to smoke, but also have a very loud music. So to, he wanted to have as much disturbance as possible throughout the, uh, the, the tra- training process to make sure that at the crucial moment when you have to make the, the, the vital decision that could decide the game or, or maybe, maybe the whole match, uh, he, will be, um, yeah, he will be well prepared and he will not be, um, um, and he will be undeterred. So it, it, it reminds me of things you write about in this book. Uh, so, you, so your recent book, Deep Thinking, about the, the match. But really, it, it reminds me of what you, uh, when you describe the games, you don't just describe the games. You seem to also describe the whole environment around the match. So, so what is a computer? How do you play against a computer? But you didn't, that's not the first time you've done that, obviously. Your first world championship match against Karpov was very much, I have to ask about this. You were down, what, 4-0, 5-0. Five zero, five zero. Five zero. And then you started this ingenious strategy of just drawing every game. And what was, how did you consciously shift gears at that point? And you were, you were a young guy, you were 22 years old. How did you consciously shift gears and were you scared of what was going to happen? Like what, what was going oh, through your man. mind? No, it's, uh, it's, you may call it, you know, survival instinct. Uh, you know, uh, you start a match, you know, I was actually 21 when I started playing. Um, I was, of course, very arrogant. You know, I believed I had to win. I I was at that time probably as good as Karpov, but you know, being as good as the world champion is not enough because you have to beat the world champion. And I, I lacked experience of playing the world championship matches. It's a different aura, you know. There's a lot of pressure, so and that's why you know early in the match, you know, I played very poorly. When I just looked at the games later, you know, I was horrified by mistakes I made because let's say game six, you know, I would have probably won the game, you know, finding this winning combination. This, it was my eyes closed, you know, but. At the board, you know, when you have all this pressure, you know, and just you look at these these options, you know, the clock is ticking, you know, it's you know, it's mistake after mistake, you know. And Karpov was either very good, you know, he was, you know, um, you may call him like you know the cleaner, you know, he just every mistake, he just grabbed, you know, he grabbed all these chances. I've been throwing them, you know, right, left, and the center. And Karpov was very good in picking them up. So, you know, after game nine, it was a four zero, and I just realized, you know, just two more, two more. Bad days, you know, because the match was played until T- one. Till six. Till, yes, until one one player, you know, or would have won six games. So, I mean, what could I do, you know? Just uh, uh, either, you know, you could just try to, uh, to to rush, you know, let's die, you know, as a hero, but just, you know, maybe win another game. But I thought, why, why not, you know, I mean, let, let Carpo win, you know? Why should I rush, you know? Why should I, you know, open up, you know? When you attack, you know, obviously you offer more opportunities for your opponent to, 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 to for a counterpunch. Um, and also, I I could play the match uh, as long as I I I, I could uh, by uh, by making draws, but also learning because it's 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 a learning it's a learning exercise. And 
I thought, well, I'm 21, you know, so if, even if I lose now, I come back three years later. At that, that time, the cycle was three right. years. But I could have this precious experience. But also, let you know, let, let him win. And well, but think, that's like an unusual strat in your career at that point. Absolutely unusual. That was like the first but, time you ever done that. But that's 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 about sort of, you know that's you know that actually what you know um, uh, built my character. So mm. again, all the components were there, but we all need a test. You know, an ultimate test. You know, you're facing you know this unsurmountable challenge, and uh, the question is how. Uh, question is how you you can. Um, meet this challenge and how can you survive you know in this impossible situation and uh, I'm it, it's it helped me many more times later on because every time I faced a new challenge every time I thought yeah it's just it's impossible to overcome I said okay what could be worse than 5-0 because it's, if, if you look at the odds you know my odds to win the match to survive or, you know, I don't know, microscopic, you know, this is, this right. is, it's, it's a against problem. the world champion. Like, it wasn't just exactly, any player. Yeah, this, no, 5 0, he, because eventually Carpo won one more game. Yeah, and it's, and uh, it's, it, it was just, you know, all lost, you know, so it's the, I don't know the odds, you know, one to quadrillion. So, it's, but I, you know, um, I survived and I, you know, I, I could feel during the match that, you know, with every game, you know, I was adding a little bit of confidence, you know, learning. And, you could also feel, because when you spend so much time with someone, you know, just across the board, you can feel your opponent's reactions. Karp was getting nervous. You know, it's, okay, he was, you know, he we started playing in September. By beginning of October, he was 4-0. October ends. November, he eventually, by the end of November, he got to 5-0. But then December, I won one game. Then January, and, and I'm still there. And he's still there. And he's getting nervous. And, and the Soviet authorities, they were quite upset because we were... he we, sort of represented them in yeah, some sense. Yeah, but it's sense. also, we, we were playing in one of, the, one of the most important halls in the Soviet Union, you mm. know, the halls of Kalm in, in the center of Moscow. And, you know, they didn't expect the match to go for so long because they, they were, it, it, the hall was needed for other, other you know, mm. um, ceremonies. By the way, some of the, you know, some of the members of uh, Octogenetic Politburo, they began to die and they, 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 they closed it, you know, once for the Minister of Defense, you know, who had to be, you know, at uh, a ceremony there, you know, when, you know, just uh, when he died. So, and, and uh, Karpov promised that he would finish the match, uh, you know, at, next day, next next week, but it went on and on and on. And at the end of January, you know, Carpo lost his patience. He made, you know, just did a push too hard and I won game two. Then they were, we were kicked out from Hall of Columns, moved to another hotel in the suburbs of Moscow. And then I won game three. So, which was still, you know, 5-3. You know, if you look at the odds, still probably in Carpo's favor. But considering the fact that he couldn't win a game for three months, he was nervous, you know. How probably, many draws in a row were that? Oh, we were 40 draws. That's well, unbelievable. Yeah, it's just, you know, we played for six months. And I, you know, I I was quite excited because, look, you know, I had a chance, you know, 5-3 is still a long way to go, but I just won, you know, two more games, you know, in, in, it was in one week. And uh, and Karpov, you know, he looked psychologically exhausted because, you know, he just couldn't, he couldn't contemplate, you know, why on, on earth, you know, he's still there, I'm still there, and he couldn't win the match. And then the Soviet authorities decided it's time to actually stop it, you know, and then started again in, in September, it was just a lot of, you know, maneuvering back and forth. I think I was on the verge of disqualification for my, you know, for my um, statements. I was outspoken, criticizing them. But then, again, I was lucky. Remember I said I was lucky. I was born in the Soviet Union, you know, and I got, you know, all this attention that I needed, you know, as a talented player. But then uh, it was Gorbachev, Perestroika, you know, so this. And eventually, you know, this is the, the all this conspiracy just, you know, to p defend Karpov out of the chessboard failed. And I remember, you know, well, after meeting one of the top uh, authorities, you know, in the, in, in the Central Committee of the Communist Party, uh, in August 1985, I came back to our residence in Moscow. I said, Mom, Mom, great news. Now, I can beat Karpov. They let me win the match. So basically, they said, it's, 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 it's not for us to, inter to interfere. You play the match. You know, who wins? That's it, you know, that's so be. They actually told you that. Yeah, yeah, that's tell me that that's that's no longer, you know, the interest of the of the of the um Politburo of the Communist Party. We are both Soviets. Uh still, you know, Karpov had a lot of support, even in 86, as uh, when we played the rematch, in even in 87, because you know, the yet so, you know, um, such a deep-rooted support among KGB and, and Soviet authorities. 
But, you know, I, I, I was already a world champion after I won in 85. And I could, you know, um, I mean, I could afford more than was uh, that 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 uh, would be allowed for an ordinary solid citizen. So, so, but but doing forty draws in a row against uh, who was then the guy who was then the world champion, that's not an easy thing to do either. Like, how do you kind of put yourself into a mindset? Okay, I'm just not going to try for it. I'm going to go for a draw. No, but it's yeah, you play safely. You know, again, it's the it's something that inside of you. It's either you can do it or you cannot do it. But it's you have to survive. You know, and. Trust me, when you have to survive, you know, you can discover a lot of, you know, things that you, 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 you didn't know about yourself. So it's just, and I... Uh, what did I, you discover then? I discovered that, you know, I could adjust. You know, mm. this is, that's about, you know, um, um, uh, it's about evolution, you know. It's the, it's, uh, I think people, you know, they, they, they often misunderstand, you know, the, the concept of, of evolution theory. This is not about the strongest species to survive, not the smartest species to survive, but the most adaptable to change. Mm. So you have to adapt, you know, there's no other choice, you know, or you die. So in this case, you die as a chess right. player, you know, you will not win the match and then you will be kicked, you know, uh, uh, back to the candidate cycle. And of course, if you lose six to nothing, you know, that will be, you know, bleeding, bleeding wound, mm. embarrassing. So you have to, you know, defend your chess owner you have to defend your your integrity as the as, as a great chess player and you know you have to adjust period and i did it and i i said i i learned a lot about myself and about my ability to adjust and I also i would point out that you know in two years later uh when we played another match the the the, the fourth match because i the, the, we're talking about the first one then we played the second i won the second match actually the, in the last game game 24 because no more unlimited matches they, they already Limited with 24 games. Um, I was, uh, Karp was trailing me one point, 12 to 11, and he had to win the last game. And then in case of tie, you know, the world champion, you know, retained the title. And he failed. He lost again. Mm. In 87, it, the roles were reversed, you know. I was trailing because I made a terrible mistake in game 23. I lost it. And I was trailing one point. I had to win the game to retain the title. And I did it. And again, it's the, it, was, it was a pure psychology. Karpo in Moscow tried to attack. You know, because it's one game, he played with white pieces, he had to attack, he tried very hard, but, you know, I defended and eventually, you know, counterattacked and won. Now, I had a totally different strategy. I thought, oh, maybe my best chance, because it's it's after 10 weeks of playing, you know, you have one game, you have to win, you know, uh, otherwise, again, you you, 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 you lose everything that you gain over these years. What can you do with Karpov? So he expects you to rush, to attack you. So why don't you play slowly, you know, just, and just keeping, keep, keep, Keep going, you know, just uh, because he's, you, you want crisis and you don't give him this, this, this pleasure, you know, the crisis is being postponed, protracted, you know, and, and he, he was looking for some kind of, you know, simplification and he just, you know, exchanged one piece and positions was getting a little bit worse. So he has been trying to force a draw. In, it's not me trying to force a win, but he's trying to force a draw, which, you know, oh, you always make concessions because you just, you, you're, you're in a rush. And eventually, you know, he, um, he gave me a good winning chance. I missed the chance, but in the time trouble, he missed the chance. The game was adjourned and it was a 50-50 call. But again, he failed to defend position, which probably was defendable. Hmm. But I remember, you know, when, because at that time we had adjour adjournments, you know, we, we adjourned the game, we played the next day. I had an end game with one extra pawn, but as I said, you know, it was defendable. And, um, and I remember I was there at stage you know, a couple of minutes earlier and then Carpo walked in and I looked at his face and I knew already, because we played so many games, I knew already looking at his eyes that he, he didn't believe he could save the game. Mm. So just, you know, it's, it's, you know he, he was doomed. You know, it was, it was written all over his face. So I, I always wonder about this in, in every field, like chess, tennis, golf. The difference between number one and let's say number 20 is how much of that is psychology? Because obviously anyone who's 20th in the world is an incredible player in their field. Um, but but what you described there, you described the whole match in terms of psychology, or not the whole thing, but a lot of it. Yeah, but we're talking about psychology of between the two world champions, right? Of players of the same status, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, there were some great players in, in in chess history that were so close but never made it. But you know, um, I I wouldn't I wouldn't even have this 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 uh, uh, drawing line, you know, between one and twenty. I would say it's probably it could be between one and five. One and five. So this it's it's it's, it's it seems that it's so close. But now just look at the current you know the uh, ranking in the world of chess. It's Magnus Carlsen, and then you look at at, at the generation of players that's of his age or older. He's just he's totally dominant. 
the only threat comes from, you know, from younger players. So I would say it's uh, uh, Fabiano Caruana or Wesley Saw. So this is the two younger players. And it's and it's it's still not clear whether they can beat him. I think there's a there's chance. But you can see that is this the world champion is just, it's more than just, you know, it's the first among equals. You know, the somebody who is there, you know, and there were only 16 world champions. We had the, you know, the, uh, the longest uh, recorded history of the official title among any other sports since 1886. And there were only 16 world champions. That tells you that it's, it's, the title is more than just winning one, one match, you know, even one tournament. The title is, is about bringing something new into the game of chess. You can look at every of these world champions. And I wrote about my great predecessors, about 12 great world books, champions. by the way. Yeah, yes, 12 world champions uh, before me. Um, and I wrote about my, all my matches with Karpov. And I haven't, I haven't written anything about, you know, uh, my uh, successors, you know, like Vladimir Kramnik, Vichy Anand, and, and Magnus Carlsen. But each of the 16 players brought something unique. It's about, you know, expanding the horizons. It's, it's making game richer. And, and by the way, you know, playing very much, you know, um, according to sort of the, to the um, sort of cultural, scientific, social demands of the day. When you look at the playing styles of the world champions, you can always find similarities with the, with the most sort of powerful and dominant uh, 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 trait of the, um, uh, um, uh, of um, the, modern life well well and and this will segue into the deep blue versus you but i remember uh, when you were when you first became world champion what you seemed the, the narrative of that story was karpov sort of he would was very slow positional style like you said he would accumulate small advantages but it seemed like he would be compared to kind of the octogenarian you know soviet union and there was there was you kind of fighting no, no, you know but, you but, sort but of represented the garbage side let's 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 but let's 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 separate you know political from you know uh, 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 political preferences and affiliation with the chess style uh, Magnus Carlsen is, you know, he's much closer as a chess player to Anatoly Karpov. So mm -hmm. when you look at the style, and uh, that's why our cooperation with him was so successful. So for Magnus, I spent more than a year with him when he was just, you know, just about to make this sort of the final jump, you know, uh, 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 leap uh, forward, you know, just to, uh, he was number four, five, you know, close, just to become number one. And uh, what helped, you know, um, him and what was why, why this cooperation was so productive is that he could learn from a player that had a totally different view uh, of 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 the game of chess. So just it's like I looked from a different angle. He could learn from uh, not from Karpov, who could be you know similar to the way he thought Magnus Carlsen, but from Gary Kasparov, who you know, looked at the position and always had a, a sort of different idea how you can... Like, what's a type of different idea? Like, like broadly no, uh, broadly described? Broadly, as you know, is this, is, it's in, in most of the positions in chess, you know, it's, you have to make a decision based very much on your preferences. You know, it's, the, it's, it's not forced win or forced draw. You just have to make a decision and, uh, and it could, you know, change the nature of the position. So that's why, you know, if you look at, you know, position from, you know, carp of ice, you know, you will say, okay, maybe I should go for, you know, no risk, but for the tiny, you know, tiny advantage, I could improve my pieces, you know. And then, you know, ten years late, ten moves later, uh, uh, in the, in in the late middle game or even an end game, that could, you know, bring me some considerable advantage. Now, if you look from you know my perspective, say okay, uh, maybe I should take a big risk, but maybe I should go with you know with with the sort of big machete, you know, so just attacking immediately. By the way, it doesn't mean that players like Carpo will not attack, or I will not look for you know, small advantages to be accumulated. But it's just in, 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 it's, it's in, in the cases where you don't have a clear preference, you know, you go with your sort of natural instincts because you always try to create position. And that's, yeah, by the way, it's, that what, you know, connects us, you know, to, to, to the computer matches. It's the, um, the way we play, you know, it's the, um, we always, you know, uh, if you have to, two top players, two world champions playing each other, the winner will be... Uh, the player who succeeds in forcing his opponent to play the game, which is, you know, more, more of, of his kind. That's why I lost to Vladimir Kramnik in the year 2000. I was as good as Kramnik, you know, in, 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 in the years after, after my defeat, we played. He never won a single game against You stayed me. number one in the world yeah, in rankings. I stayed number one in the world in ranking. But, you know, in the match, you know, I pushed too hard, you know, just, you know, trying to actually you know, uh, um, refute some of the ideas that Kramnik brought in. By the way, extremely, you know, uh, uh, fertile ideas that are now, now dominating the opening theory, for instance, modern chess. Mm. 
instead of you know just you know changing changing the, 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 the gear. So I, Kramnik was more flexible. So I was well prepared on ninety percent of territory, but he found this ten percent you know little island you know, and I you know. Okay, you may call it stupidly, but it's probably arrogantly. I wanted just to actually d- to demonstrate that I could actually beat him at this at this you know tiny piece of territory instead of trying to actually drag him into sort of the um, into the wilds. So 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 this does segue into the Deep Blue match because that was very much a match where Deep Blue just in its hardware could could outplay you at your the best version of your game the tactical side the fighting side of your game like you you were nervous about getting into a, a highly tactical affair with it when the, even though that was your style uh, absolutely it, it forced you to play a different a, style it's a very it's a, it's it's a very important very important observation so i just for for the audience to understand that you know uh i was you know i was at disadvantage because my favorite style you know was not you know a, the right approach against the computer so against the computer, you have to play what they call anti-computer chess, which means, you know, being a defensive, you know, actually waiting for a machine to attack to create weakness and then to counterattack. That's not exactly, you know, how Gary Kasparov played his, his best games. Uh, but but before we move into the match again, I want to emphasize that the, the book is not just about the match. This is the, it's probably, you know, um, it's a hook for the audience. You sure. know? Uh, also, obviously, the publisher liked the idea that the book will be released at the day uh, the twentieth anniversary of the day when the second match was was uh, um, uh, opened in New York in in, in nineteen ninety seven. It's May second, but uh, um, you know um, I wanted also in the book to um, um, to dismantle the mythology around the man and machine and about artificial intelligence because now all we hear is either some utopian views. Oh, fantastic, phenomenal! Blah, blah, blah. It just you know it's it's all going to be great, but. More likely now we hear these dystopian views, you know, which is coming from great minds like, you know, Stephen Hawking or great inventors and, and doers as Elon Musk. Oh, right. It's, it's almost it's, disturbing it's, what they're saying, but go ahead. But Sorry. exactly. This is and it's and it's it 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 um uh it's it connects to people's minds because of, you know, we're a generation of that that grew up with Terminator. Now the next generation grew up with was the Matrix. It's all about the horrors of artificial intelligence actually, you know, stealing, you know, everything from us and stealing our world from us. And um and I try to also also to uh, in the book to um to explain the things in, in a very simple language because some great books like you know Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom, but they're they're very sophisticated, so it's very hard to read. So I tried to come up with a story that has a personal, you know, uh, component, a big personal component, but also it's in a language where, you know, which helps people to understand, look, it's not something un- uncommon. The entire history of human race is inventing machines that are stealing our jobs. But for millennials, uh, okay, centuries and last decades, we saw machines, you know, getting more and more intelligent, but still, you know, taking over jobs from, you know, blue-collar workers. Now, now they're going after white-collar workers and after people, you know, with Twitter accounts. So now we say, oh, wow, this is, this, it threatens the world. No, it's, this is the way the, the progress works, you know. It, machines, you know, getting more intelligent thanks to our, you know, our creativity, which makes us in turn more creative because we have to come up with something new. So it's a new cycle. But because now it, it attacks, you know, intelligence, you know, like human brains, it seems, oh, it's, 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 it's a game changer. No, it is not. It's just, you know, it's, it's like a spiral, you know. It's, a, it's the same season, but again, it's at, on a higher, you know, level of the spiral. A very simple example, uh, and and this doesn't involve AI at all, but it does involve automation, is ATM machines. Everyone thought bank tellers would go away and bank bank branches would go away. But in fact, because of ATM machines, it became cheaper to build a new bank branch. So now there's more bank tellers and bank workers than ever. Exactly. This is in the book I talked about, you know, about uh, the elevators, you know, they, this, this, the, there was a union. 17,000 operators, you mentioned. And, you know, but then, you know, people were, by the way, scared, you know, they were scared of, you know, of, uh, of elevators, automated elevators that were available, by the way, from the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. But people still preferred, you know, someone to operate the elevator as now they're afraid of driverless cars. Yeah. Uh, Then what it took, you know, a, a strike. 
in New York City, you know, that's, and then, you know, if, when you have to, you know, uh, go all the way up to the Empire State Building, goes on an elevator, you understand, maybe, you know, you should, you should, you should uh, 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 overcome your fear and push the button, you know. Right. So the ele- the, these jobs disappear. Okay, some of them, you know, in, 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 in concierge, uh, they're still working, but it's, 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 a, it's a tiny drop of what it was before. Uh, and, uh, um, and I think it's, again, it's, this is a normal development of, of technology, uh, if if we have something really breakthrough, something very disruptive, it means it kills jobs before it creates new jobs. But now people are not happy because they want you know new jobs to be created, old jobs to be kept. Sorry, it's not going to be this way. So that's the that's the way capitalism works. You know, that's the way the the free market works. You know, you come up with new disruptive ideas, and you know you make many industries redundant. So so hypothetically, how do you but see new, it play new jobs out? are being created because they're just. It's a problem who's going to take these new jobs. You know? Right. And so, so, so let's take self-driving cars as an example. So people theorize it could be up to 90% of the auto industry just completely gone once there's self-driving cars out there. How do you see it play out so that eventually those jobs kind of find their homes elsewhere? The answer is I don't know. And that's good news. I don't know. That's the, that means disruptive. That mm-hmm. means breakthrough. We all know. It's as if we knew, you know, it would not be it would not be disruptive. So that means that you know we have to get creative. You know, we have so many things that we drop because it's too, too risky. Maybe we have to start, you know, space exploration. Maybe we have to look, you know, under you know, underwater, you know, deep deep water exploration. There's so many things we stopped in 60s and 70s because we said, oh, maybe it's too risky. Maybe we just, you know, we can we can be happy with 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 you know small you know incremental improvements because when we look at the at the technology that we're using today, it's Okay, it's it very, it's very, it's very convenient. You know, it's it's very handy. But iPhone Seven is not Apollo Seven. You know, it's the all our devices they're getting thinner, you know, shinier, lighter. But this is it's not breakthrough. So we 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 will be facing you know the the same challenges that people hundred years ago. So when when they just saw this the the industrial revolution, you know, changing changing the face of the world. Well, you can argue. Um uh, the internet, even though it wasn't necessarily a technological huge innovation, it did. It was a social innovation that, uh, combined with no, technology. By the way, it was. It was. This, the problem is people believe it was invented in 1989, though the, so the foundation of the internet. In, no, excuse me, in the 60s. It was a part of the DARPA project. And in 1962, Leonard Kleiner came up uh, with um, you know, uh, packet switching uh, theory. And in 1963, the scientists of, of DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency that's uh, working for U.S. government. They came up with a full description of internet, including Skype, voice mm. over IP. You know, mm. it is. It was all described by Dr. Joseph Licklider in his. It was in in uh, in, um, in um, uh, his concept of intergalactic. <laughs> Sick intergalactic. You know, just I emphasize it. Computer network. I like how they think in these science fiction terms back then. But that's but <laughs> that's that's how they made things work, you know. I I you know, I had the privilege of 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 um, meeting and then speaking to to uh, to Professor Kleinrock, and I asked him how come that you were you know you were just not even thirty in 1962. He came up with this you know concept of machines talking to machines, you know, uh, just packet switching. And he said, you know, I was a big you know fan of of Nikola Tesla, and I, I had a dream. He said, uh, I had a dream to make machines talking to each other. That's you know that's what we are missing today you know that's 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 why and you know, I just I, I want people to not to be afraid of this progress because there's so many things we can bring back if we start dreaming again by the way machines cannot dream even in the sleeping mode well and I think that's a big confusion too with AI is that they conflate computer achievements with human intelligence when they're not related at all like again the way a computer was able to beat you was not by giving it human intelligence but 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 improving the hardware to such a point that it could calculate as fast as potentially you could. Uh, look, okay, uh, it's the regarding the match in, in 1997, I always want to emphasize that in 96, I won the match. The first match we played, I won. Then I made a huge improvement, I agree. And uh, and I'm very complimentary about the, 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 the accomplishment. I'm highly critical of the way corporations run the match because IBM was an organizer, you know, the right. referee. Just, and obviously, you know, certain things they did during the match, they... They had, you know, they had an effect, negative effect on on Gary Kaspar as, as as a human being, you know, just you know, you because if you are you know losing self control, if you are nervous, you know, then you are vulnerable. And playing against the machine, you know, if you're vulnerable, you're dead. So that's that's every mistake we punished. Um, 
20 years later, I spent a lot of time analyzing the games, you know. Now, it's, it's to be objective, you know, that's the, I played the match very poorly, you know, way under my ability to play a match at that time. I was not well prepared. I was wrong in my, you know, anticipation of deep blue strengths. I have to admit that they made much bigger progress than I, I expected. Uh, but still, you know, I think that if we played another match, the, the rubber match, I would have won. Mm. In that, it doesn't mean that, you know, it could change, you know, sort of the, the, the tide of history. It's, it was already writing on the wall. So right. this is, and by the way, you know, I lost the game one of 1996 match. And, and we may say that's, you know, that's as important as me losing the match in 1997 because machine could have won, you know, one game. Uh, it it, it right. has won one. And that's enough, you know, it's winning one game means eventually it will win, you know, more than one game and it will win the match. And in the next few few years after 1997, there were, there were other matches. Vladimir Kramnik played, I played other matches. You know, until 2003, 2004, we still could compete with, with, with um, other machines. They were not as powerful as the blue in hardware, but they were far more sophisticated in software. They mm. had just, you know, better and much, much better engines. But it's, it, was, it was like you know, a competition, a race against time. And today, you know, in, I'm not sure about, about uh, your phone, definitely on the iPad, but maybe on your phone you can have, you know, a chess engine that is as good and even stronger than, than Deep Blue. Like I have a shredder on my phone? Yeah, of course, yeah. That's yeah. this. You know, uh, we, I, I, I worked with, with, with my assistant and we checked, you know, uh, the Deep Blue games on, 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 on um, our laptops. And you could see that it's just, it's just the machines. They are, I don't know, there's hundreds, hundreds points of ELO, you know, stronger than, than, than the, the blue. And and by the way, there's, there's some mistakes that, you know, that I couldn't even expect, you know. The game five, which is, you know, interesting. It's, it's, um, it's, it's the, my last chance to win the match. It was 2-2 two, two, and I, I was pressing hard. Eventually, the deep blue found like a miraculous way of saving the game. But when you now look at this game with a computer, you just realize that it was full of mistakes from both sides. And Deep Blue made a mistake in Endgame. It's what it had, you know, both sides had Rook, Knight, and 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 uh, four pawns. And instead of forcing a draw, as being shown by every engine today, within a minute, Deep Blue spent more than a minute and made a move that was losing. Mm-hmm. So it means you know that any computer today would have just you know uh, crushed Deep Blue. In, in 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 this in the in in this roughly you know even end game but it's it's a drawish in a, in a drawish end game um, but, but it, it doesn't it doesn't get it doesn't change you know the 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 uh, as you said it's just the um, the import the importance of the uh, the importance of the match since you know they won and it's just yeah I played poorly I could have done better but it was a very important you know uh, step forward because it's it basically it reached a point. You know, where for Alan Turing and other, you know, giants of the past, the story was over. And we, by the way, discovered that it's not because it's well, it, there's it always not about new, AI. Right. And there's always new problems. Like 10 years ago, facial recognition was a hard problem. Now it's it's done. Like computers could do it. 10 years ago, Go, the game Go was a hard problem. Now they beat the world's uh, best Go player. Go is this, Go is, I'm not an expert on Go. So that's why I, you know, you have to be, uh, uh uh, you have to be cautious in in in, in accepting my uh, yeah any 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 of my statements. C- cautious uh, caution noted. Caution, yes. It's then see, I, I I don't I don't have rights to speak with the same authority as 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 of the game of chess. But all I know about Go, you know, this game is so complicated. You know, this this and it's 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 more difficult than chess to be to be cracked because it's not about calculation. This this more conceptual, but also the quality of human. Playing Go is much lower than that in chess. I mean, when I say much lower, that the world champion in chess, you know, um, it just you know plays again ideal. If we look, if we look at ideal moves, he's much closer to ideal ideal uh, uh, game of chess than than a Go player because in Go you can have you can make mistakes, you know, since it's it's the game is so complex, um, and since the game is not as you know as um, Steady as the game of the of, of 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 the world champion. So machine, which I think it's it's not as sophisticated as as the chess engines, it still you know has as an uh, upper hand because because um, machines are always you know they 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 play sort of the level game. It's it, it has a, you may call it steady hand. Mm. So that's why you know if you are playing if your game is uneven you know it's ups and downs you are very vulnerable. Uh, I don't. I think in Go, you know, the the world champion can play, and he can he can keep losing. In chess, I think Magnus Carlsen was white pieces. 
I think he could make a draw if he wants to. Mm. So today, so so it's. But, but he probably can't win. No, no, win, win is, win is, win is almost impossible. I think it's just, I would say, ninety nine point nine percent impossible. Maybe if you give him ten chances, ten games, and tell him that it doesn't matter what happens in any game. If he, he he wins the match, if he wins one game, maybe he has a chance. Mm. If he plays, you know, with just with with all full, you know, uh, uh, rigor, you know, just you know, and and he's not afraid of losing, so then maybe he has a chance. But there's one thing that you know that 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 prevents humans of uh, beating machines in chess. Um, uh, it's a level of accuracy that is required to win against a machine. Because even in the best games that we play in chess, you know, when I played with Karpov or Magnus Carlsen plays today with his opponents, um, you can see the, the, the great games, 50 moves, 45, good quality, four great moves. There's always one inaccuracy. I'm not talking about terrible blunder, even about a mistake, inaccuracy. Mm-hmm. Which is almost unnoticed for human eye because again, okay, it's this the it's like you know gifts are returned. You know, so I make a mistake, you know, you, you, and you return the favor. Mm-hmm. It, and also when my, when your position is is bad, so you very often you're just losing your stamina. So okay, it's bad position. So who cares? How, how, you know how good is your opponent in actually delivering the final blow? Not with a computer. Right. Computer doesn't care position is winning or losing. It just looks objective at every moment and it looks for every chance to escape. So that's why one inaccuracy could throw your, you know, 49 uh, uh, good moves, your, your six hours hard work. Uh, and it's, I think that this kind of vigilance is almost impossible for, 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 for humans. So that's why winning the game is highly unlikely. Making draws for the world champion in chess, doable. So, so you said if if you mentioned one thing though, you said if Magnus Carlsen is not afraid. So, how at, at that level, world championship level, how do you kind of almost I don't want to say hypnotize yourself, but how do you kind of psych yourself up to the right persona when you're at that level of uh, playing? Now, I, I yeah, I want to emphasize again that what I said about fear, mm. because you know, uh, fear of making mistake almost guarantees mm. your mistake. Uh, and um, why is that? Uh, because you know it, it paralyzes you. It's 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 um, you know if you have to make, game of chess is a game of choices. So you have to make decisions. You know every move is a decision. Okay, in the openings you can follow the fa- the famous lines. You know in the end game you can just follow the sort of the the um, end game manuals. But in the middle of the game, you know you're on your own. You have to make you know, choices, sometimes choosing between, you know, roughly even options. And it's all, it's always about risk, you know, if, especially if you want to win the game. And uh, making decisions, you know, you have to be confident that your decision is good. And if you if you fear uh, that your decision is not good, if you fear that, it, you know, you can lose the game, somehow, subconsciously, it paralyzes you. It just, it, it, it um, inflicts a damage to, to, to the decision-making process. So that's why if you can actually remove the fear, that's why I said playing machine, Say, you play, doesn't matter. You have to win one game. You, it doesn't matter if you lose nine. But just as long as you win one, you won the match. That could actually change the equation because it could, you know, uh, unleash an amazing power that is inside, but it's always being, you know, restrained by our fear. I, I kind of like this. How can, um, I almost want to have this just walking outside, at, you know, out the door and have that kind of power. How do you, how can you kind of... Um, Hypnotize yourself in daily life to uh, to avoid this fear. Uh, no, look, I think fear is always with us. This, this is, it's. I don't believe when some you know people say, "Oh, yeah, this man, this woman, they don't have fear." We all do have our fears. The question is how we can handle it. Um, I don't have a special advice. So is the I do recognize our fears. You know, especially you know you you, you grow up, you have families, you have kids. You know. Fear is, is just, you know, it's, it's, it's a normal element of our life. But when you play, you know, it's the, it's... At that competitive level. At a competitive level. That, that's why it's impossible to play chess at my age, competitive level now. Because, you know, you have so many other things, you know, that, you know, your concentration on the same, you have other problems, you have fears, you know, normally. Because you grow up, you know, you have other responsibilities in your life. Well, let, let's talk about that. You, you also recently wrote an excellent book, Winter is Coming, and you... you it's about uh, Putin and Russia. You've been outspoken 
uh, as a kind of a, I don't know how you describe it, an activist Democrat in Russia no. against against Putin and his policies and, and many other things about how Russia is one. You even tentatively ran for president of Russia uh, shortly after you re- retired from chess. So, so, you know, is this more a part of your daily life now? Uh, you no, know, my daily life, you know, is comprised of different components. So it's the, it, it's um, writing on my social about politics, uh, but other things as well. So also writing books. Um, it's also, you know, quite a significant chess component because uh, um, I keep building, you know, uh, uh, and uh, um, spreading around the world, Casper Chess Foundation. It's a 15th anniversary that we started the first one in the United States. Uh, and I can proudly say that now uh, the U.S. junior team under 18 is, is the best in the world. Uh, surprise, surprise. It's just, you know, you, you keep working with these people. There's plenty of talent and you just find this talent. And if you, you know, invest your time and the resources, so you you actually reach re- results similar to what was in the Soviet Union 40, 50 years ago. Um, and we have other foundations in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, in, in, in Mexico. Now we just opened one in Paris, in Francophony. Uh, and uh, you know that takes time, you know. So I'm 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 trying to actually you know build my legacy in the world of chess, you know, in ed- bringing chess to education, but also creating a new rating system and uh, a network of competitions, bringing sponsors. So I'm not actively engaged as a chess player, but I think you know I have certain responsibilities of making it work. What do you think? Um, h- how does chess and education in general benefit kids? Because it seems like there's many benefits. What are, what do you see as? Uh... I think it's one of the one of the best tools to um, sort of enhance the. Um, the uh, modern educational system because, you know, we live at a time when it's much less relevant what you teach kids rather than how you do it. Because, you know, if we if we agree that education is about, you know, preparing our kids for the future life, you know, this is, and they, at age, you know, eight, nine, 10, and, 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 and as a teenagers, they have to learn something that will be useful for their lives. Now, how can we be sure that what they're l- learning today will be relevant because most of the professions and new professions that they will be seeking 15 years from now don't exist. And by the way, we even don't know what would be, you know, what would be right. the most, what would be at, at, at the demand, you know, 15 years from now, since many of the of the best paid jobs today didn't exist 15 years ago. It, it's so, so true. Just the other day, I saw a job, uh, a help wanted ad for a self-driving car engineer. Like five yeah, years but, ago, but that would have been a science fiction but 3D, job. But <laughs> what about these 3D printers, you know? Yeah. This is the, 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 the social media managers. Again, this, most of these sort of exist, these, uh, um, uh, exciting jobs today, they, you know, they were products of 21st century. So we should just, you know, realize that it's very important to actually make kids, you know, um, uh, adjustable to these new challenges. So it, it, it's all about algorithms, about patterns, recognizing patterns, seeing the big picture. And chess is perfect. You know, it's all about your learning how the move that you make on the queen side could affect, you know, something that happens on the, on, on the king side. And also, it just, you know, it's, it, it's, it's the best training for cognitive skills. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a very general thing that, you know, helps them to absorb this information and, and you know, build these patterns and bridges, connect things. It's about connectivity. So, um, and one more advantage. It's, an ex- it's inexpensive. You don't have to build a swimming pool, a soccer field, you know, a uh, uh, tennis court. It's, you know, it's a part of the of, of the classroom and it, it could be connected to computers. So it's um, it's it's it's, a, it's an ideal tool. And we have been very successful promoting it, you know, in, in, in the most advanced uh, uh, schools in this country or in Europe and in the most sort of desolated areas in Africa. So the, it seems also there's kind of the the meta aspects of learning something like chess, like there's a discipline. Like how yep. when you were young, how many hours a day did you study specifically chess? No, but discipline, of course, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a hard work. But we don't, it's, it's you know, this is, you know, we're already probably moving to the semi-professional side of that. But if you talk about a social effect, uh, you know, I can tell you that in, in, in places, you know, as I mentioned in Africa, you know, uh, you could see the drop of the absentee rate. Because kids mm. are excited, you know, they go to the school. They play. Something, exactly, they play. So it's, it's, it has a social effect. Also, you know, in many places, it's, again, uh, in this country or in, in, in other, you know, um, parts of the develop, uh, developed world, it's hard to imagine that before you actually start teaching kids, whether it's in Africa or, 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 or in, in many parts of Asia or Latin America, uh, especially in Africa, where we had plenty of experience because that's one of the most you know, successful foundations, Kasparov Chess Foundations. 
And I personally traveled across the continent. I visited 22 African countries. Mm. So, uh, and I know we just did it's first hand experience. You have to convince these kids that education has a value. Because here we know, it's, 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 the kid goes to school because his father, his mother, they went to school. Their, you know, uh, mothers and fathers went to school. So this is, you have already generations that, you know, that know that school is, is, is a part of the, of, of the, of the routine. You know? Now, you are talking to people that, you know, that's, that's, that, that never had education as a part of, the, of their life, you know. So it's the, most of the parents of these kids, you know, they, they never attended schools. And, uh, you know, they, God knows if they can, you know, they know how to write. So you just have to convince these kids that education has a value for them. So that's why anything that makes them excited is very important. You have to you drag them in. So you have to explain very simple things, you know, like up and down, right and left, you know, concept of center. So many things that we can do with chess, you know, as the, as a, it's a good, you know, it's, it's a colorful way of, you know, of entering the educational system. And then again, God knows what happens, but it's very important that they, they have an appetite to actually become educated. So, so you know, it, it, there's a, there's also the aspect of having a coach or a teacher. So again, in education, there's there's a teacher, and you mentioned the effect you had on Magnus Carlson. You mentioned Bob Vinick's effect on you. What's the role of like if you never had a coach like Bob Vinick, or if Carlson never had a coach like you? Is, is there a, a cap? Like, does everybody to reach their potential? Do people need? A mentor or a coach. We're talking about professional chess now. We're talking about professional, yeah, professional. But, but, but in any area, really. Yeah, but in, that, in, uh, in uh, any area, to reach your potential, you know, you need your mentor. So that's, uh, it goes without saying, even at the age, you know, at the digital age, you know. Though, of course, we have to admit that today, you know, a young player can learn, you know, more about, uh, um, uh, more than Bobby Fischer ever knew about chess, you know, in, in, in a year or two by just, you know, working with computer and, uh, and with this very average assistant. Uh, but in order to reach your potential, especially if we're talking about, you know, someone like Magnus Carlsen, who is, you know, destined to go to the very top, uh, you, need, uh, you need help, you know, like, it's not from generation to generation. That's what I learned from Botvinnik, you know, this, it's the way, you know, he looked at the position, the way, you know, he uh, analyzed it. So it, it helps, it's a very general advice. It sounds, you know, trivial, oh, it's an advice. But, you know, it's, there's, there's always you know, a piece of wisdom. And it helped me that I, I worked with Botvinnik, but I also, you know, was close to other great champions as Boris Spassky and Tigran Petrosian, and I learned. And, uh, and now, I, you know, I, I've been doing it for years, you know. I think it's also my duty, you know, just to, uh, to pass this information, to pass this knowledge, this wisdom from those, you know, the giants of the past, you know, the, 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 by my great predecessors, to those that, that, that are now, you know, just trying to conquer the, the highest peaks of uh, the chess world. So, so you know, just to, uh, to close this off, I want to mention uh, on the political side, you know, this morning, um, obviously, e even though this podcast is going to come out, you know, a few weeks later, uh, this morning there was an explosion in, or maybe two explosions in St. Petersburg. Uh, you came in here, you were getting texts about it. Uh, what's just your, you know, given your, your stance on, on Putin, how does this fit into your, your, st your stance on, on what's going on in Russia right now? Look, uh, what, and we're, Trump seeing, and all what that. we're seeing in Russia now is just, you know, Putin is desperate to stay in power. He knows that, you know, he can't leave Kremlin and retire. So there's, there's too much blood on his hands, too much money has been stolen. So he's the dictator for life. I've been warning for years, more, for, for more than a decade, that eventually Putin will be everybody's problem because when dictator runs out of enemies inside his own country, he goes elsewhere. And that's what Putin did, you know. Now, to stay in power in Russia, he needs to keep, you know, Russian population in fear of, of problems uh, that could, you know, jeopardize their lives. Uh, for them not to realize that he is, you know, so the, the, the main problem that is, is, is preventing uh, them of, of getting decent lives. And uh, uh, Putin, made, uh, Putin has made confrontation with the, with the free world, especially with the United States, as a core element of his domestic propaganda. And uh, for those who believe that, you know, if you make enough concessions to dictator, you know, he'll leave you alone. No, he, he will go everywhere. He will keep creating new uh, hot spots on, on, on the map, you know, new, new problems, you know, after Ukraine he went to Syria, now he most likely to Libya. He has been interfering in elections across Europe and, of course, in, the, in, in this country because confrontation is what helps him, you know, just to create chaos. And chaos is very important for dictator because he hates 
united opposition. He hates, you know, strong organizations like NATO, European Union. He wants to divide, which is, again, mm. it's just it's, it's as old as this world, you know, divide and conquer. And he's very good. He's a KGB guy. He's not a military dictator. He's a KGB guy, you know, creating, you know, chaos, creating instability, creating suspicion, you know, blackmailing, bribing. Uh, he has enormous amount of money at his disposal, you know, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars that he could, you know, channel one way or another. And he's not shy of buying favors and uh, uh, for politicians, for business people. You know, we heard already comments that if you try to, you know, um, um, undo, you know, Russian uh, um, malicious influence in the financial system in the West, it could, you know, it, it could kill all the markets because there's so much money that is just, you know, in, in different places that, that you know, um, help Putin to uh, promote his clandestine agenda. And of course, we know that KGB, you know, uh, from 50s and 60s, uh, helped different terrorist organizations. Using terror was very much a sort of KGB signature you know, to, to um, uh, promote, uh, uh, promote their, the Soviet agenda at that time. And uh, Putin still has an answer to the very, you know, um, serious accusations of uh, apartment bombing in Russia in 1999 mm-hmm. when, it, you know, he started Ch- Second Chechen War. And it, it paved his, 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 his way to power. So it, is, it created Putin, Putin the fighter of terror, uh, against terror. Putin, um, Putin the, uh, the savior of Russia from, mm. from the Islamic radicals. And uh, all the terrorist attacks we had, you know, at, in, in, from 99 to 2004, uh, what was left at that time of Russian independent media reported that you could see a KGB uh, um, uh, traces there, so uh, you could you, you could see the connections. So that this uh, people who were involved, they somehow you know uh, uh, worked worked either with KGB or, or 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 had these connections. And as for the explosion in Saint Petersburg today, um, as we're recording it, look, it's a moment where Putin needed some kind of destruction. Again, I'm. I believe in presumption of innocence, though, of course, in, in case of Putin, you know, as many dictators, you know, I think it's, it works the other way. So it's the, it's the, um, the benefit of the doubt, you know, goes, uh, goes against him. Um, but Putin first, uh, first time in many, many years faced a massive demonstrations in Russia in, 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 that involved uh, the new generation. And I think that was a shock for him, you know, with tens of thousands of Russians in marching in the streets. And some people say, you know, what is a ten of tens of thousands? It's a lot. Because it's not something that, you know, you could do, you know, without any harm for you. So here you can have, you know, a million people marching and police protects you. In Russia, you go on the streets, police is against you. So that's the... Well, you've even been in the streets. I've and, been arrested, and, beaten, you know, yes. spent uh, t- days in jail. So, but at that time, you know, that was like, you know, it was an easygoing time, quote unquote, because I could spend five or ten days in jail. Today, for the same quote unquote crime just for dist- what they call disturbing public order, you can spend five or 10 years in jail. Mm. So this is, in 10 years, you could see, you know, what has happened in Putin's Russia. So that's why I uh, think that it's, it's the, we can, we can suspect that the, uh, the, this attack in St. Petersburg was another product of, of, of KGB because, you know, it helps Putin to promote his agenda in Russia. I believe, you know, soon we'll see uh, sort of new draconian laws, you know, just uh, uh, limiting what, what what's left of of um, freedom, individual freedom. Uh, I think that they will um, they will impose new security security measures. Also, I think it will help Donald Trump here to uh, uh, sort of um, uh, to brush off the uh, Kremlin gate to all these accusations and to start talking again about cooperation with Russia against uh, radical Islamic uh, uh, terrorism. Uh, mm-hmm. Again. We don't have any proofs, and I, I'm afraid that we will not find the truth about Putin's crimes as long as he stays in power. So we will not we will not find out who actually ordered the murder of Boris Nemtsov, my late uh, um, uh, friend and colleague and ally, one of the most prominent uh, and brave Russian politicians who was murdered uh, uh, um, uh, two years ago um, in front of Kremlin Kremlin's gates. Um, but uh, do you ever get worried, you're? Gonna, um... I live in New York. I mean, it's this, this, this. It was not my first choice, but for four, it's four years. Four years since I left. I left Russia. I live in New York with my family, and uh, you know, people keep asking me, you know, can you go back to Russia? My answer is yes, I can go back to Russia, but it will be one way trip. Right. So, so okay, deep thinking by Gary Kasparov. 
Uh, great book about artificial intelligence plus your personal stories. And, as, and, and it's how to overcome your fear about artificial intelligence. You know, this is just you have to treat right. we have to treat human progress as something inevitable. You know, when if it's raining, you know, you can complain about it or you can buy an umbrella. You know, it's not a one-dimensional story. This is not, you know, this is nothing linear. You know, this is not, you know, that, oh, you know, I read the book, I read this article, and I know everything. This is again, this is it's more, it's more psychological. So this is all about us, you know. Again, fear, you know, we should not fear science, we should not fear progress. You know, even if it may threaten us directly or indirectly, you know, maybe we can lose a job or maybe we'll not, we're not sure, you know, how we can, you know, advance uh, in some of our endeavors. Look, you know, there's, there are always ways, you know, so it's the... What's a technique for thinking about how to adapt? Because obviously you've been doing it, but, but the, the average person who's, who is scared, what do they, what do, they do? Look, I, again, it's the, it's, it's, I know the, the, and I actually mentioned in the book, the, um, the, the thought that, you know, that is, even if I lose as an individual, you know, the human race wins, uh, you know, uh, 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 as an, as a whole entity. I mean, it's, it's, it, it doesn't warm you up. Right. I understand it. But, um, you know, we are, we all benefit from progress because, you know, we have all these devices, you know, in our pockets or in our purses, you know, that helps us to, you know, to learn more about the world. You know, just think for a moment that we have so much power, you know, in our hands, you know, in just ha keeping in hand in our palm. It's it's thousand times more than the United States uh, um, had at a time when uh, NASA had when Americans landed on the moon. So with so much power, something can be done. You know, this is, I don't know exactly what you can do, but there's a lot you can do because there's so much power is given to the individual. And it's very important that we are not, you know, wasting these opportunities. We're not complaining. You know, we just, you know, we should be optimistic and we should always overcome our fears. Great. Well, thank you once again, Gary, for, for coming in. Deep Thinking by Gary Kasparov. It was a great book and also was a big reminder for me because I just remember being in the audience watching. And, I, and, I, and again, I remember... 1989, when Feng Shui was building the predecessor to Deep Blue, I That's was there. Mentioned, so. It's mentioned in the, in, in the book also. You know, Deep just... Thought, 1989, I remember it well. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. These days, we're all investors trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.